A welcome to our podcast for this coming Palm Sunday, in which we're going to be looking at the Old Testament reading, Zechariah 9, 9 to 12. And I can almost read your mind. Okay, maybe not. I'm not that good here via podcast. But this is a Sunday that, as you know, is a difficult one to deal with, uh, mostly because you got a lot going on. Is it Palm Sunday? Is it Sunday the Passion? And holy schmoly, there's a lot of reading going on. Uh, that said, I realize that preaching is going to be a little difficult, but should you go the Palm Sunday route, which frankly I would encourage you to do, uh, this Zechariah 9 reading gives you something to mine that really could you know, really give you a richness to your preaching for this coming Sunday. Uh, that said, it's Zechariah. Uh, yes, Isaiah, we've heard of that book before. Malachi, maybe. Nahum, ah, uh, who knows. Uh, Zechariah is buried in that book of the 12. It's in the Minor Prophets. So the first thing we need to consider, even before we jump into these relatively short, pretty straightforward verses, is what's going on in Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah is one of our post-exilic prophets. And as a post-exilic prophet, he's dealing with a different set of issues than our 8th century prophets like Isaiah, than our exilic prophets like Ezekiel, Jeremiah. Namely, Zechariah is a book of encouragement to those who are struggling to rebuild the temple. The post-exilic period creates a crisis for God's people. They start out with a Davidic leader, Zerubbabel, who fades from the scene. And this Davidic covenant is now very much open-ended. Will God keep this promise of 2 Samuel 7? And in the midst of this crisis of temple being rebuilt, of Zerubbabel, who was, who was disappeared by the time of Zechariah, that these words burst onto the scene. Uh, Zechariah 9, 9 to 12. And perhaps somewhat surprising, in terms of the Palm Sunday account, Zechariah 9 is the book that shapes the theology that the gospel writers use, as it provides hope and encouragement. Like anything, nature of the lectionary being it, as it is, is that we oftentimes forget its immediate context. If you're to back up to the start of chapter 9, you'll discover that the issue becomes the destruction of the nations. Uh, one of the major commentators describes this as possibly looking ahead to the invasion by Alexander the Great, which could work to a point, but the big idea here is that everybody is getting destroyed, but Jerusalem is being preserved. In this midst of everybody dying around them, except Jerusalem, we see these relatively familiar verses. Now, as we turn our attention to this, now I hope to be relatively familiar text. The language is governed by the Psalter. Rejoice, O greatly, O daughter of Zion. Give a ringing shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Bat, bat repeats. And here we have a good example of personification going on. Not only do we have personification, we also have synecdoche, in which Jerusalem is uh, referring to the greater whole of God's chosen people. Uh, note, gali, 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 hari. It's this big rejoicing language. And now we move on to the good old word, hane. For those of you keeping score at home, hane gets us excited. Hane is the attention getting particle. Behold, your God is coming to you, righteous. And here we have a niffel of Shaba of Yesha. And the niffel here probably uh, has a reflexive sense uh, in which it refers to showing salvation. So he's righteous, Zadik, showing salvation. This word Zadik is one of our primary characteristics of a Div Davidic leader. He is righteous. He brings about order. He follows in the divine ordinances. But now things get interesting. In the context of big kings, look at how our king is described. Ani, poor, and riding upon a donkey, upon a male donkey, the son of a, of a mare. This language of donkey, we all know relatively familiar stuff. After all, we see it every Palm Sunday. But the point of this king that bursts onto the scene to people struggling in this era of a Davidic crisis is that here's a king who's acting completely differently than any other king the people experience. 
Fast forward to Palm Sunday. This king, Jesus riding into town, is not riding like Alexander to war. He's not riding like any of these great leaders, Caesar, Rome, take your pick. Instead, he's riding, into, he's riding to establish his kingdom. And that now moves us to the next verse, in which we go from descriptors of this king, who's Zadik, righteous, showing salvation, poor, riding upon a donkey, to now we get into how this kingdom is established. The language becomes somewhat more militant. And he will, br and he will cut off the Rechev, the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse, the Seuss, from Jerusalem, and the bow of the battle, the battle bow, will be cut off. Uh, the language here is pretty typical ancient Near Eastern military language, and that we have essentially every major weapon of war that's mentioned. A Rechev, the chariot, the horse, and the, and the, and the war bow. A great way to show a contrast between any earthly leader. Instead, we have a leader who now take a look at the next word. Vadeber shalom, la goim, who speaks peace to, a, speaks peace to the nations. Uh, this word is shocking when compared with any earthly ruler and shows us so much about Jesus. What does Jesus do? Jesus speaks shalom. And shalom here is not just an absence of conflict. It's a restoration of a relationship. He speaks shalom to the nations and his dominion from sea upon sea, from the rivers unto the edge of the, of the earth. This is a great contrast to any earthly empire. Earthly empires, take your pick, Assyria, Persia, Babylon, Alexander. They establish their empires. This one is a, this, this king speaks peace, and it goes to the ends of the earth. And it gets better. Gam at. Uh, gam indeed, note at. Uh, it's awkward for me to say this on a podcast, but I will. I get excited about pronouns in Hebrew. Yeah, not that exciting, but it is. The pronoun here is, placed, is fronted. So typically we think verb, subject, object. Here we have a fronting of the pronoun for emphasis, plus the pronoun is somewhat redundant. Indeed you bade here instrumentive by means of the blood of your covenant. There is some debate over the nature of this covenant. Uh, typically, according to most commentators, this refers to possibly Sinai. But as a Christian interpreter, we can see this looking forward to the covenant that Jesus will establish through his blood just a few days after Palm Sunday. So indeed you, by means of the blood of your covenant, I am shalak, I am sending your prisoners from the cistern, indeed from the water, from, from the thing in which a particle of non-existence, in which there is no water in it. Uh, this language should seem to be somewhat familiar uh, echoes of, no, of Joseph, who's stuck in his cistern, who has nothing to do with his brethren, and the fact that he is all by himself in the well. But the language of prisoners echoes this reversal of militant language, that this is a king that sets prisoners free. And then it concludes with this most peculiar expression. Shavu, that's just a cal imperative, uh, return to your fortresses, and now this is the great expression in here. Uh, note it's in a construct state, state asire ha tikva, prisoners of hope. If I were to preach this, and when I preached this in the past, this idea here is in some ways the greatest message of hope and a bit of an absurdity. Prisoner of bad, hope good. But to be one who experiences Messiah means you're captive in hope. You're captive in faith. You know the end is going to go well. Thus you are a prisoner of hope. Uh, that image I would play around with. You can really have fun with it. Because it is a great way to describe what it means for us with everything going on. 
to still be held captive in hope, hope in the Messiah, not only in terms of his first advent, but also in terms of his second. Indeed, today, when it is told to you, a magid, no, you have a mem, plus a patak under the performative, that's a hifil, a hifil participle, and in the day in which I am telling, uh, we're dealing with poetic texts, so take it, going based upon context, Yahweh speaking, and now we end up with the final message of hope. Uh, Mishneh Asiv Lach. A double I will give back to you. A double here means a lot. A way uh, to finally conclude by describing God's graciousness. It's so much that not only does God restore them, but when God restores them to his state better than before. Uh, this text, as we now t reflect on where to go with it, uh, gives us plenty of uh, different options. If I were you, I would be playing around with this prisoner of hope idea. It's a great way to describe where we are for this coming Holy Week. We are people that still are prisoners of hope, after all. We hope in the second advent of Christ as we once again revel in the celebration of Christ's first advent as he comes as a different sort of king, a king who speaks peace and who brings it about through his death, a king who brings peace with a word that extends to the, end of the ends of the earth. Let this message of hope to your prisoners of hope, if you will, be a message that you can proclaim. Granted, it's not going to be a long one. You have a lot going on. But may this be your message as well, as you hope with your people, as once again you begin this most sacred time in your ministry, this most blessed Holy Week. May God bless your individual ministries throughout our country and throughout the world. And peace for now.